All right, so this is definitely going to be the most obscure mythology I've ever covered on this channel. Bonus points to me being the first one to ever cover this mythology on all of YouTube. Susan will have to love me now. If none of you have ever heard of the Avarians, much less their faith before, that's for good reason. They are a long-forgotten race who once lived in one of the least discussed regions of the world, that being southwestern Asia, and for the most part they lived in relative isolation, choosing to settle within the valley of a mountainous region which locked themselves off from the rest of the world, save their one singular coast which may have opened up the possibilities for nautical exploration had they not been so damn scared of the ocean. No seriously, these guys vilified the shit out of their god of the ocean and his mistress, but that's a story for another day. Luckily for us, the Averian writing system is very close to that of Egyptian hieroglyphics, except even more literal. And because their religion played such an integral role to their population that the central figures continued to remain prominent cultural figures in that region for generations to come, the Averian mythology is remarkably well preserved and may actually tell us a little bit about their cultures and customs than we had initially thought. For example, it's all but confirmed that the early, early Averians had some sort of contact with the ancient Mesopotamians as there were quite a few parallels to draw between the Mediterranean-based faiths and this nonsense, meaning that perhaps at one point in time they weren't totally socially isolated. However, it seems like the pleasantries of that meeting were felt only off to one side, as there is no archaeological evidence from the Sumerians, Babylonians, or even the Persians, which even mentions Averia. So, R.I.P. I guess. But hey, you guys didn't come here to listen to some sob story about a long-dead society which made about zero cultural impact upon the rest of the world. You came here to listen to some crazy-ass story about a long-dead religion which made zero cultural impact upon the rest of the world. So let's get into it. Those of you who have been a part of my channel since the beginning probably know how this story begins. Say it with me, ladies and gentlemen. There was a void simultaneously containing everything which ever was and everything that ever will be and yet nothing at all. This is one of those creation stories where this void is sentient and longs for some sort of companionship. And so, reaching into the deepest, darkest depths of its own being, the void creates the primordial deity, Izaiklu, the slumbering giant. However, the void made a small miscalculation, as when Izaiklu came into being, he was already an old man. And as anyone who has ever had to hang out with the elderly at a nursing home for Beta Club might be able to tell you, old people don't exactly make the greatest companions. So while the Void was sitting there trying to make conversation with his new creation, his Iklu was drifting off to sleep, because he was having an old. Offended and heartbroken, the Void decided that he didn't much care for his Iklu anymore, and tried to create a new being to kill him and take his place. However, he had already put all of his eggs into one basket to create his Iklu, so he basically fucked up twice over now. So far, I'm not too impressed by the intelligence of this Void. Anyway, the Void decided that since creating an entirely new being was off the table, he would have to create some new gods out of his Iklu himself. Reaching out, the Void stroked his Iklu's long silver hair, and then his beard, and finally... Okay, I need you all to be mature about this one, because Lord knows I sure as shit can't be. The Void reached out and stroked the hair of Izaiklu's genital region. While he was sleeping. Also, keep in mind that technically Izaiklu is the Void's son. You know, for some reason this passage reminds me of my own dad. After he was done with his creepy old man padding, the Void was left with three new gods, or as the Avarians called them, Jir. Now, if you're a little confused as to how that happens, keep in mind that these people lived in an area of the world which got to be pretty dry during the summer months. And due to some unfortunate genetics, the Avarians frequently suffered from some pretty severe cases of dandruff. So, while some of you may see a creepy old man giving his sleeping son a pat-down so that he can create the next generation of Jir to murder his ass, I see a charming reference to a common issue which frequently plagued the native peoples of this region being incorporated into their professed origin story. About a creepy old man patting his son down while he's sleeping. So, these Title IX violations resulted in three new Jir. Kaishu, God of Time, Ophenis, Goddess of Purpose, and Simo, God of Hopelessness. 
Kaishu is pretty self-explanatory, though Ophenis and Simo may require a bit more explanation. You see, the Avarians, in addition to being highly hydrophobic social outcasts, were also quite the philosophers who pondered on the moral quandary of whether or not fate exists or if every action is determined by the free will and actions of the gods and their people. Evidently, the conclusion that they reached was a little bit of both, as we're about to see, but these two sides of the same theological debate are supposedly so prevalent that the Avarians felt the need to personify them, which again is really cool and makes it all the more shameful that they are such an isolated people, otherwise we could have seen these sorts of ideas spreading out into other foreign lands in their mythology before the advent of Gnosticism. Getting back on track though, the Void tells the children of Izaiklu that murdering their father is really cool and touching them inappropriately while they sleep is perfectly natural, and so then told them to go ahead and have at it. The murdering part, not the touching part. Although I'm sure he wouldn't object to that either. However, this plan gets off to a rocky start as Simo and Ophenis just want to argue about who will become the main god after they are finished killing Izaiklu. This bickering prompts the giant Jir to wake up in a cranky rage, and so he smashes the two children together like a lump of Play-Doh, then fucks off and goes back to bed, leaving Kaishu to stand there over the flattened corpses of his brother and sister. He then turns to the Void and says, I don't know what the fuck just happened, but I don't really care. I'ma get the fuck up out of here. Fuck this shit, I'm out. And so the Void is forced to come up with another plan to rid himself of his first son. So I'm sure you are all very familiar with the definition of insanity. It's trying the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Well, that's exactly what the Void does from here. And by stroking the exact same areas all over again, three new gods fall out. They are Safet, god of light, Makari, goddess of life, and Machari, goddess of death. The Void attempts to offer this new generation the exact same advice he did to the previous ones, and inevitably another argument arises between Makari and Machari, because of course life and death are opposing forces. However, the nature of this argument is a little different, as instead of arguing who should hold dominion over the world, Makari and Machari argued to the methodology of how they should do it. Makari, the smarter and more beautiful of the two sisters, argued that they should carefully plan out how they were going to go about killing the giant several hundred times their size, though her sister Machari preferred a more direct, brute force approach. Fortunately, Kaishu is just a little smarter than the Void and puts some bitches in their place putting a stop to that argument before it can get a little too loud. Deciding to instead resolve their sisterly quarrel without verbal argument, both Makari and Matri took a handful of Simo and Ophenis' composite corpse and fashioned their own lesser deities to populate the rest of the remains and argue on behalf of their creator's outlook on how to dispose of his Aiklu. Machari created monstrous creatures, impure of heart but frightfully strong, each one of which represented a different negative aspect of Avarian life and so were commonly referred to as the Naugir, the evil or dark gods. The first of the Naugir were Saran, god of destruction, and Preya, goddess of chaos. Meanwhile, Makari busied herself by fashioning four other more benevolent and smarter gods, known as the Apogir, or the four gods. Okay. These children were Agir, god of the fields and rivers, Seraphim, god of the oceans, by the way, fuck this guy, Cleo, goddess most closely associated with fertility and foliage, Targalos, god of the mountains, those are important for later, and finally, the Mac Daddy of the entire pantheon, Zahn, god of the sky and male vitality. Yes, the god of boners was the chief of the whole pantheon. Also, I know that there are technically five gods, but the Avarians didn't want Cleo interfering with their boys' club, so they indirectly excluded her by naming convention. What are you gonna do, file a Title IX lawsuit against a dead guy? Go fuck yourself. So, in the accordance with the mentality which spawned them, Saran and Preya immediately started going at it, fucking like rabbits to produce yet another generation of Naugir. From this fornication, it's technically fornication because marriage hasn't been invented yet, Saran sired nine different children. Keratos, Naugir of Pestilence, Groth, Naugir of Famine and Insects, Igdarok, Naugir of Feral Beasts and Eventual Father to All Monsters, Psylocke, Naugir of War, Thrall, Naugir of Skyward Storms, Sassel, 
Nausir of earthquakes, fissures, and caves. Aqueous, Nausir of typhoons, tsunamis, and drowning. And Fey, Nausir of ice and the winter seasons. And while these new kids definitely had more than their fair share of methods in mind to kill a Zyklu, the Apogir, and more specifically Zaun, figured that slow and steady wins the race. And so he hatched a brilliant plan to cultivate underlings to the Apogir, who would one day produce a hero capable of felling the giant and preserving the existence of all creation for generations to come. Though that again is a story for a later date, right now they need to figure out how to make humans first. Turns out the formula is just as dirty as the method the Void used to create the six original Jir from Izyklu's Dandruff. So Zahn tells his brother to get down there and till the earth so that they may plant the seeds of all life on earth. Seeds which were literally planted by Cleo, uh, well... <sighs> you see, boys and girls, when a woman loves herself very, very much, sometimes she sticks her fingers into her snatch and ends up squirting everywhere. That's the charming theme of creation by masturbation from the Egyptian mythology again. So glad that this came back up. Anyway, seeing this and thinking it looked like fun, Zahn decided to join in and shoot his goo, my dude, right where Cleo did. And this resulted in the fertilization of the seeds of life. However, Zahn noticed that despite this, the seeds were not germinating, and so figured that he was missing a few essential ingredients. And so, he flew up to Safet and steals a little bit of his light, forming the majority of it into a condensed ball of radiance before tossing it skywards, where the giant Jir caught the light in his right hand. This mass of light became known as the Sun. Zahn then scattered the remains of the light that he stole upwards again, whereupon Safet caught them in his left hand, leaving behind the imprints of the stars. I'd like to point out that this little game of catch between uncle and nephew is the closest we ever get to bonding between the Apogir and the Primordial Gir, so cherish this moment for all its novelty while it lasts. Now with a sustainable source of light, Zahn figures the last thing life on Earth needs to flourish is a little bit of two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. However, seeing as the periodic table wouldn't be invented for several thousands of years, he was at a loss as to where he was going to get it. Until he spotted his brother Seraphim, who had just settled himself into a nice and cozy recess in the ground dug out by Ogier. Either he was really scared of the Naujir, or Cleo and Zahn's exhibitionism got him all hot and bothered because this man was sweating literal buckets. Thinking this stuff coming out of his brother's brow was just what they needed, Zahn gathered Seraphim's sweat in his hands and once again cast the water skywards before it fell down to earth and filling in some of the deeper patches of tilled land with water to form the few rivers that the Avarians actually had. Finally, the seeds had everything they needed to germinate, and from them sprang the grass, trees, animals, and most impactfully of all, humans. Impressed by Zahn's brain and something else which was big, Cleo threw herself at the Sky God, and from there the two decided to get hitched and raise their semen babies together. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, the Avarian creation story. I hope you all enjoyed our dive into the mythology of this long-forgotten people and their religious beliefs as much as I did. If I must say so myself, this is one of the more creative tales I've ever seen and really does show how certain big-dicked 140 IQ paragons of masculinity can be. Before we go today, I'd just like to say though that I haven't been very forward with you all. None of this was real. And no, I don't mean like in the meta sense where Religions is for fools and liberals, <laughs> sort of sense. I mean, this is not actually a creation story. There is no such thing as the Averian people. That creative, big-dicked, 140 IQ paragon of masculinity? Yeah, that was me. You see, folks, I am a writer by trade. And this channel is but one of several passion projects which I have been working on for the past few years. However, I was also inspired by Lord Dunsay's Tales of Pagana, and that got me to thinking, what if I was to write my own fictitious place, come up with some fictional culture to populate it, and write a mythology from the ground up explaining how that place came into being, where the people believed themselves to come from, and why every time there's thunder, there's storms. And now here we are. Now, I should state that I took a lot of influences from a multitude of different mythologies when writing the Avarian mythology. 
In fact, it's so extensive that I really just don't have the time to go over it all with you guys in the short amount of time I have left in this video. However, if you guys are watching this video the same day it goes up, which also just so happens to be my birthday, I'll be doing a live stream right here on the channel going over the work in progress I have so far as the mythology goes, and I'll spend a little extra time chatting with some Discord members and going over the many influences which inspired this work. Link is in the description. This was more of an experimental video to see how well people liked the idea, and depending on its reception, I may revisit it in the future with a later round of videos, and, and who knows, I may even publish a full-blown book on it. We'll just have to see. In the meantime, if you liked what you saw here today, be sure to subscribe to the channel to stay up to date with all my future uploads. And if you could, leave a like and comment, as those both help me out with Susan's algorithm from hell. New Patreon-exclusive content should be going up right around the same time this video goes live, where I show off the collection of books and resources I use to make these videos, as well as my disgusting calloused hands. So, if you want to join in there for $5 a month and be credited at the end of each and every one of my videos, like these wonderful human beings over here, as well as Discord moderation privileges, that's definitely a link I'll be keeping open for you guys. Discord link is also down below if you want to join in there and be a part of the Q&A stream I'll be hosting tonight for my birthday, so go ahead and check that out. With all that being said though, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Messiahs of Mythology, and I hope you all have a God's blessed day.